Hey everyone, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Welcome uh, to a conversation we're going to be having about a film that hopefully you have just had the chance to see, The Antidote. Uh, my expectation is maybe it even made you cry um, once or twice, it certainly did for me. And we have the great good fortune of over the course of this next hour, we're going to get to visit with the folks who made the film, John and Kahani, as well as their colleague, uh, Rain, who's helping to put the film out into the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about how it all came together and what the plan is to put it out into the world and hopefully take more than a few questions from you so we can uh, reflect together on, on what we've all learned and what the path ahead is for these good folks. But before we do that, a couple little pieces of housekeeping, as we always do. First thing I'd like to invite you to do is uh, take your finger or your cursor, whatever it is you use to manipulate your computer. And if you would go down into the chat function, chances are that's at the bottom of your screen. It says the word chat, there's a little thought bubble next to it. Hop in there and, and you know, John and Kahani, Rain, if you wanna do this as well, feel free. This is a practice we've gotten into over the last year, uh, an idea that we borrow from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston, the two word check-in. So if you would go ahead and put your name in, where you're coming in from, and then those two words that kind of describe how you're doing right now. Hey, Eric Brown. Well, Eric Brown, you do deserve a lot of credit because you helped to put us in touch with these good folks and, and put the antidote in front of all of our good friends inside the network. How are you doing? Because you just said hello, but love to know those two words. How is everybody doing? Others, feel free, join us. I'll type in here. He's doing amazing. Right on. Uh, other folks, go ahead and hop in the chat. Kahani, how are you? And I'll see if I can do this myself. Hi. I'm a lousy typer and an even worse speller. So let's see how we'll do. I had Sean, uh, happy and uh, excited. And let's see, Rain coming in from Westchester. Janet, how are you? Feeling hopeful. John, how are you? Kareem, tired and hopeful. Yeah, it's been a long week for a lot of us, but hopefully this hour is gonna be restorative. Maybe you found that as you were watching the film as well. Uh, so with that, Mr. T, uh, Tristan Mahabir, my colleague who runs the slide deck, is doing so again today, as he always does. Again, that's the that's probably familiar to you. You probably saw that in the email from us, but that's the poster for the film. Hey, Sherilyn, how are you? Uh, Rebecca, excited and hopeful in New York City. How are you? So we got a lot of New Yorkers with us. Anne-Marie in Tucson, scared and mighty at the same time. Anne-Marie, I think Arizona is going to get some news for us a little bit later today, which we're all excited to hear. Carrie, how are you in D.C.? Hopeful and tired. Yeah, I think all of us are going to need a nap. It's going to last about six, seven weeks. Uh, Kari, how are you? Where are you coming in from? Bemidji, Minnesota. I'm proud I can pronounce it. I have a friend from Bemidji, uh, Lene Erickson, old colleague of mine. Wonderful town. She loves it a lot. Uh, all right, well, folks, still be in conversation with one another. I'm going to talk at you for just a quick minute, give you a few updates specifically for those of you who are participating in Com Network V+. So Tristan, if you would, go ahead and take us on over to the next slide. Maybe you saw this today, our friend Makaya Moody gave a shout out to one of our other colleagues because she's part of V+, and we sent everybody who's participating there a little leadership coin. It looks just like the one you see here on the screen. It's, a way, uh, it's an old habit actually started in the U.S. military. They're called challenge coins. You'd hand them off to people who did you a solid or a, rec a way to recognize folks who maybe did you a little bit of good. And so we passed these on to everybody in V+, and we've been inviting people to take them, both the digital versions or the physical version, take a picture of it, and hand it off to somebody. Micaiah uh, rewarded our friend Melanie Newman Roussel from Planned Parenthood for being just a badass in, in her words. And so you may be seeing that on social through the hashtag comms for good. Uh, look for those and see how folks are lifting up and acknowledging and celebrating some of their friends and colleagues within the network. It's a really cool thing to see. And this year, particularly, if someone's been especially kind to you, something we're going to be talking a lot about in the next couple of minutes, this is a great way to recognize them. So keep an eye out for that. Hey, Natalie, how are you? Nervous and sleepy up in Detroit. Also, some good work happening up there in Michigan. All right, Mr. T, if you would carry us forward. Uh, a couple other things just really, really quickly. So uh, coming up uh, very soon, but not next week. It was supposed to be next week. We had to move the date out. So if you're planning for this, just keep an eye on that. November 24th, our friend David Brotherton is going to lead a conversation with these extraordinary folks from uh, single subject nonprofit journalism organizations. So Grist, The Marshall Project, and The Trace will all be with us to talk a little bit about what the world of journalism might look like over the next decade or two with these nonprofit entities that are uh, arriving on the scene, much like our friends down at the Texas Tribune. All right, let's go ahead forward, if you would, Mr. T. 
We're also, uh, early December, gonna bring in all our peeps from Chicago. And I just learned Kahani is a U of Chicago grad, but they're gonna be talking to us about a really important thing that a lot of us have, find ourselves doing quite a lot. And that's taking really important research that's maybe a little bit dense and finding ways to get it out into the world with the people who can most uh, use it or apply it. So, and finding a way to maybe do that in plain English at the same time. So that's coming up December 2nd. Mr. T, if you would, go ahead and crank this forward. And then really excited about this. Uh, Kevin Hun and his colleagues from People and Company were among the people who created Creative Mornings. Uh, they have some deep insights to offer us in how you build community. And we're deep believers that if you work in the communication space, particularly if you work in communications for good, well, the fact is, look, communication happens at the speed of trust. And trust happens when you're inside a community, when you have understanding and you know one another and you're there for one another. So we're going to talk a little bit, with Kevin, about some of those lessons that he learned in creating Creative Mornings, the community they built there, and how that might have application for many of us in our work. So that's coming up December the 9th. If you would, Mr. T, last one. I think, all right, so this, why don't we hang on this screen for a little bit and I'll just introduce uh, the folks who are gonna be joining us today. John Hoffman and Kahani Cooperman are celebrated and decorated filmmakers. And they've spent the last little while of their lives putting together the story that I hope many of you have had a chance to see over the last couple of days. They were very kind to make that available to us before it's actually out in public. Uh, joining us as well is their colleague, Rain, who's gonna be with us, Rain Henderson. She's helping them get the film out into the world. And so we're gonna be in conversation. But before we do that, let me just tell you, in addition to that chat box, hopefully you see a Q&A box there and I'll look in both places for questions. But our aim here is to have a conversation. So Natalie or Will, Kari, Carrie, whoever it might be, if you've got a question, toss it in the chat and I'll make sure to serve a sort of interlocutor on your behalf and we'll get to those questions. But why don't we start Kahani and John with just a very simple question. It's the one you're probably getting an awful lot, which is this. Where did this idea come from for this film? How did this come to be? And I'll invite either one of you to take a swing at this. Kahani, maybe just John, good manners as a Southern uh, boy. We'll start with you. Oh, you want to start with John? I actually do because it really did start with him. And so I think he's, he's the best to kick it off and then I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take the baton when he, well, because at the right moment. <laughs> I, I, I'm, it's actually a really wonderful opportunity to uh, spend a little bit more time on on the origin story, um, the, the very beginning of the origin story, which um, is with uh, the nonprofit <clears throat> health system that's primarily in the West Coast called Dignity Health. Um, I had started a, a media nonprofit um, uh, about six, about eight years ago called the Public Good Projects, which is still in existence. And we had the incredible good fortune to get to know uh, the leadership of Dignity Health, um, their head of communications, Mark Klein, um, and their CEO, Lloyd Dean. And they gave a, an incredibly generous gift to this media nonprofit that uh, is still exists and is doing you know, incredible work, um, primarily focused on public health um, and how do you leverage the power of the media to really drive more conversations around public health. And so I, uh, in a follow-up meeting um, with Lloyd Dean, the CEO, and Mark Klein, I was asking them about their focus on kindness um, as a sort of corporate philosophy and, 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 uh, and really consumer-facing identity as, as a health provider. And what came up in that conversation was um, re revealed that there's a true commitment. It's very deep. Um, and it's very wide. And I made an offhand remark, would you be interested in doing a documentary about kindness? And they said, let's talk about that. So I went back to meet with them in San Francisco um, to really um, explore what this might mean to support an independent, fully independent film, um, just on this single concept, a single word, kindness, not knowing where we would go. And they, um, they said they would like to. And so I teamed up with Kahani, um, who is someone who um, some uh, wonderful filmmakers that we both have in common um, suggested I, I had to meet. We did not know each other pri prior to that. Um, but I it quickly, it was immediately clear to me um, that I wanted to go on this journey with Kahani. I did not want to do it alone. Um, I like having creative partners. Um, and we, um, we had this uh, remarkable opportunity to have the resources and what we like to describe as this giant blank canvas. And obviously you are, 
have seen the results of that work, but where it began was that that canvas had nothing on it and we had one word, kindness. Um, and where do you go with that opportunity? It was daunting actually. Um, and so we put together a small team and we just dove in um, to a research period where we read as much as we could um, about compassion and empathy and kindness. Uh, we read philosophy, we read political philosophy, economic theory, um, and um, at a certain, and we talked to lots of people, um, and at a certain point we said, we just gotta push that all away. Um, uh, and we said, what do we want? Let's project ourselves forward um, when this film is done. Are there a set of questions that we feel that we um, want to have answered? And what might they be? So we did this exercise and what came out of it um, truly guided us forward. Um, they're very simple questions. Um, they are, how do we raise our children? How do we teach our children? How do we take care of the sick and the dying? How do we live and work together? How do we welcome the stranger? And how do we lead? And we felt that those questions, if we found stories that explore um, what is in fact the lifespan and the worlds that we all move through um, and examples of, of effective programs that are you know, with great intention lifting others up that we will have done our job if we felt like we had answered those questions. Um, and I'll pass the baton to Kahani because um, something happened which sort of rocked our world. Um, thanks. Um, so, so just to add before we get into um, what sort of was a real pivot for us in terms of our thinking of the film is like, this is about two and a half years ago when John and I had that breakfast when we first met. And, you know, I, and I know John shared it, you know, there was this pervasive feeling of just civility, just crumbling around us. And so when I was presented with an opportunity to like, think about this idea of kindness and what that could mean and not, not really a soft kindness, not which, you know, you have to kind of battle uh, against the perceptions of kindness as, of being soft. But I think we both agreed really quickly that silent, uh, that kindness is, um, uh, is, is actually can be a, a fierce tool um, that can, can be used to really, really ch make change. And so um, luckily, like we, we felt similarly, similarly about that. And, um, uh, you know, delved in and, and came up with these questions um, uh, that we wanted our film to answer. And also, um, you know, thought maybe is there one story that touches all of this? I mean, there really isn't. And, and for us, we couldn't, find, we didn't really see it happening just with one story, which is one of the many reasons why we decided to focus on multiple stories in this. We also wanted to create a portrait of this entire country and represent many voices and of, of, the, of the people who live here. And so um, it, multiple stories really became our, our approach. And, and we didn't want one story per question or anything like that, but one of the criteria in finding stories was to see, uh, you know, can they touch on some of these questions? They might be multiple ones. Um, so we were working along and um, Charleston, uh, Charlottesville happened, not Charleston, I'm sorry, Charlottesville happened. And, um, you know, it was a real uh, in your face kind of reckoning of, of uh, a lot of things in the situation in this country. It's not like we were blind to them prior to what happened in Charlottesville, but, but it happened to be at a moment in our production where we were like, you know, we are, we are not doing justice to the work of all of these people and those who are helping if we don't address within each story um, what we identified as fundamental unkindnesses that unfortunately many Americans live with every day. So we spent more time identifying what those are and that's lack of a safe place to sleep, 
lack of access to health care, lack of a living wage, and that racism, homophobia, and sexism, you know, are all fundamentally unkind. And so um, those unkindnesses became as important as our questions in terms of our lens um, through which we were evaluating stories and doing our research and going down the rabbit holes. And, you know, of course, additionally, these stories have to be cinematic. They have to have characters that you're, you're, you're going to care about and compelling situations that might unfold before our cameras. Um, you know, we just didn't know. There's always a, a, a gamble aspect to documentary filming because you don't know how things are going to turn out like real life. Um, so that's kind of that between those questions and the fundamental unkindnesses, those were, that was our jumping, those together were our jumping off points for identifying um, stories. Um, and ultimately the, you know, the stories you see in the film. How did your, uh, speaking from your personal experience, how did your definition of kindness evolve through the making of this film? So if you were mm -hmm. to find kindness in one way a couple of years ago, and how has it shifted? How have you seen that evolve over the last couple of years through the experience of making this film? Um, Kahani or Jeff? Yeah, I can, I'll, you might be a little sick of my voice, but um, but I'll speak to it and then I'm sure John will add too. You know, for, um, for, for myself, uh, I, you know, I grew up with examples of kindness in my family and my parents. I've made previous films to sort of explore um, the better, the better angels in us and that connect the human connection that we all have through um, kind of goodness, I guess. Um, but for me, uh, what this help, film helped do was to I sort of identify for me the, the difference and make me think about the difference between random acts of kindness and intentional acts of kindness. And that was the, um, you know, the sort of, that also helped us determine stories because the intentionality was, became so important. And it's not to belittle the, the beauty of random acts of kindness, they're important, but we kind of knew that's not what we wanted this film to be about. And so I feel like really think about intentionality where there's an individual or an organization, you know, looking at a problem and, and thinking, what can I do to improve this? Like this, the intentionality of that, that choice to do that is really meaningful to me. And it's sort of changed how I look at myself, how I'm functioning in the world and how I see others um, reacting to things. And John, what about you? How did your, your understanding of kindness shift or evolve over the last couple of years? I was just sorry. I was, uh, people wanted to know what the questions and the unkindnesses were, so I was putting them into the Q&A or the chat room. Oh, so, sure. So they're, they're there now. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I think that for me, the, the kindness, um, I came to, to Connie's point earlier, the, the soft aspects of kindness um, were, um, and the, the notion of random acts of kindness so dominate the sort of greeting card nature of, um, or the associations of the word and the way it's, it's, it's used in sort of popular culture um, were not what I was interested in or what I, I felt, um, um, were shaping my own experience. I think that the areas of fairness and decency um, and uh, are so much um, more important to me. And I think I, I come from a family where, you know, social justice is something that we were raised with. Um, and so I think that coming out of the 2016 election and having this opportunity or having this, this need to feel like I, use, I can use the power of, of, of the work that I do, which is to reach people through mass media and, and feeling like, you know, what can I do? And then be given this opportunity to address kindness, which is such a counter narrative to, you know, what the, the dominant media is so focused on. Um, and that's where I felt like we naturally gravitated towards is this, the, this the, more this area of, of fairness and, and decency. 
Um, so I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I, I think that that's you know, what I'm, I'm more inclined to, to be focused on, on those things or, or um, my, I'm, I'm more attuned to sensing where I'm seeing unfairness and indecency. And we were sensing a lot of that starting in 2016. What, uh, so obviously you then were, were charged with as you were putting this film together and, 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 and collaborating with coming up with the stories that would illuminate the, 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 the series of questions that you wanted to get to. How, because a lot of the folks on, on joining us now are, are storytellers themselves. And one of the challenges we all have as storytellers is finding the stories and finding the folks that you can use as proxies for larger ideas. How did you all do that? Because you were also casting a, uh, you were literally casting a net across the entire country. How did you how did you come up with the subjects and the stories you wanted to highlight? Well, there's no one way. I mean, it's we were employing you know sort of everything. It's just it's 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 now your radar is up, um, and you're talking to people and you're talking to sort of trusted sources and sharing what you're doing. And people, someone would say something, and that would lead us down all these these rabbit holes. Um, you know, there's a there's a um, interesting way that you can tie things together. Um, as we said, how do we take care of the sick and the dying is one of the questions. Um, and I've worked um, in and out of healthcare in my career. And I've um, been amongst people who have just a remarkable ability to spend time with people who are, who are dying and have an ability to talk about it. We were very interested in exploring that. Um, and so we heard about a psychiatrist at Mass General who does you know, um, uh, very important work um, in end of life care. Um, and we met with him and, um, and, I, and read a book that he, he, he wrote and he mentions Jim O'Connell um, as being one of the people he went to school with and you know, sort of the path that he went down and he says Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. So radar goes up, you start looking there, we, realize Jim is doing remarkably important work as many people have now seen in the film. But then we're with he, he and his, him and his team and one of his team makes a comment, you know, if you're looking at this, you know, I read an article in the Boston Globe about this community in Western Massachusetts where, uh, you know, it's where elders are helping to raise foster children. You know, you should look at that. Well, we went and we visited wasn't the right time to film there, but we learned that there are six communities like that in the country. There should be a ton more. It's as people who've seen the film, it's an incredible model um, to be replicated in every city. There's, this is you know, bringing you know, low income housing for elders for low, together with low income housing for people raising foster children is just the most beautiful you know, sort of municipal you know, sort of effort. Um, but that's how one thing led, led to another. There, there's a story behind every story, but here's how we, you know, connected the dots there. Honey, how about you? Any reflections there on, on how these stories came together or whether there was, a, was there, was there a board somewhere where you all were looking <laughs> and saying, all right, oh, we, what, ha we had, we had this or what, what's the cinematic story that we can tell? Yeah, we, we had a giant board and, um, uh, we, we worked off that during the pre-production time when we were developing this, these ideas, we had it going on in the edit room. Like we were all about our board and it, it really, we took pictures of it along the way and it shows interestingly, like the evolution of our thinking about this. Um, you know, just for example, uh, there was one point where uh, we were considering very seriously and kind of assumed we would have, you know, big thinkers, household names, uh, woven throughout the film, commenting on all of this and lending their wisdom. And um, once we started really talking to the people who we were going to be uh, filming with, we realized, and once we started filming with them, we realized like, we don't, we don't need third party wisdom in this. These people are our experts. And so, yeah, we worked, that doesn't speak to your original question, but it does speak to sort of the evolution of this creatively and how we did work off boards with, you know, everyone from, uh, you know, John Lewis was on there and Jimmy Carter and, you know, all kinds of 
all kinds of uh, movers and shakers. Um, and we didn't end up going that route at all because the people we met were really so incredible. But also it's like, it's not enough to just identify the stories that you you know, want to do or want to find out more about. It's like from that very first email, when you reach out to them, you know, uh, a trust game begins and you're knocking on their door. It's often, uh, you know, very sensitive um, situations where they're protective of the people who, who um, they serve. And so uh, we, you know, had to really um, cultivate trust and relationships with all these people. That's everything in all documentaries. And even, even once you um, get, you know, past the initial, like, they say, okay, you can come check us out, or you can come film, you know, you have to um, really, really uh, make sure to be so respectful and to honor their wishes around the communities that they're in, um, because they're, you know, they're putting themselves on the line in a way by trusting us. So um, how does, how do you, you know, I think part of filmmaking, especially specifically documentary filmmaking is the relationships between the subjects and the filmmakers. And that's where the trust comes and that when, if you have trust, then you can help get access. And that's when people become honest and allow themselves to be vulnerable. So that also, um, you know, there's, there's people who we went a little down the road with and they decided, you know, it wasn't quite for them or there were minors involved and they couldn't get the right permissions or, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's not like every story that we tried to do happened but a lot of them did. And I should add that there's um, four that um, live on our website uh, as really powerful, if I do say so myself, short films that are no less powerful than what made it really into the film. But we were really um, worked to you know, go all over the country and explore these places with the people who we established these strong relationships with. And I think that, you know, uh, one of the reasons I think people have an emotional response to our film and I think to most films and documentaries is because you feel like you can connect with the people in it or you care about what's happening to them and I, I'd like to think that some of that is because of these relationships that you know John and I and our team developed um, with them along the way um, and I and you know, not to offer you your own segue, but I think that also goes for our partnerships with our funders um, in this in, in this film too. Um, you know, there was a trust and a collaboration that was not only wonderful and fun, and but it's and it was beneficial. It made it a better film. So that's also, especially given what your organization does and who you're speaking to, I just think that's a really important idea to bring up and maybe, you know, chat about because uh, we're so appreciative of, of our partners on this film. They, were, they weren't just a, someone writing a check. It was much, much more of a relationship than that. And, and a similar trust too. So, yeah. We have a number of questions that have come in. So I'm gonna jump through a couple of those uh, and then we can come back to this idea of working with funders. But it seems to me, and maybe you can riff on this as I get to Janet's question and Carla and Sherilyn and Anne Marie, I see you all and we'll get to all of them. But it seems to me that implicit in all of this was community. Now granted, obviously there's a few individuals that are highlighted in the film, but, but even the way you created the film was through community and through networks. Is that a piece of kindness? Is community kind of an integral piece of this? It's obviously part of the creative process. But is, it, is, is that essential for kindness? Because you did sort of at the outset say, we're going to avoid random acts of kindness and think about this a little bit more systemically or a little bit more structurally. Either well, of you I, want to jump in on uh, that? You know, um, there's, a, there's a phrase which I always cite at the end of the film from uh, a retired uh, social studies teacher in Modesto, California, who was part of the creation of the world religions class. Um, and she says, you have to be kind and decent to live in a civil democracy. And to me, that is also the definition of community. Um, and so we, this, this notion of community 
became hugely important to us. And we say in the beginning of the film, stories of kindness, decency, and the power of community. Um, because while we did not identify the power of community when we were writing those questions and it was not top of mind for us, um, it's what we were witnessing. And when we were, the, the, the first place we visited, not with our cameras, but just visited, um, was the Center for Discovery uh, in Sullivan County um, and Hurleyville, which is this small hamlet um, in, in, in that area. Um, and this is seen in the film as this hamlet where you have the, the, the integration of the residents who are part of the Center for Discovery with all kinds of mixed abilities who are living, working, dancing, uh, uh, eating together in, 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 in the local restaurants, um, volunteering at the fire department. I mean, this, this was just such a beautiful um, illustration of the power of community. Um, and so underlying that is, is kindness and decency in how everybody is engaging with one another. But everyone's life is better. <laughs> they're, leading a, they're leading good lives. Um, and so, um, and the fact that they are all, you know, um, feeling that and, and aware of how they are benefiting as people, um, it became very, very powerful and we had to capture that. You, you can't go there and not say, we're coming back to capture this because it also spoke so powerfully um, as you know, to the times we're living in. Um, that this is happening and that our communities are good. Um, and so, um, and that's also this notion of goodness um, is something that um, is just yet another way to describe you know, what, what motivated us, capturing goodness. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. And I think it's something I, I would just say this year, I think for a lot of us has been an experience in the power of community you know, leaning on neighbors, checking on each other, looking after one another, crying on each other's shoulders, whatever it may be. I think a lot of us have had that opportunity in ways that maybe weren't evident to us or we didn't participate in back in 2019. And not, not too many gifts in 2020, but maybe that's one of them. Uh, our friend Janet has a question. She says, can you share a story that surprised an act of kindness that was counterintuitive or that shattered a stereotype, I suppose, for, for either of you? Uh, I mean, for me, the thing that popped right into my head with that question was the story that takes place in Decatur, Georgia, which, um, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of exposure to the, to the Southern Baptist community in my life. I just haven't. And so I definitely have, um, you know, probably fallen prey to various stereotypes. And so to, to discover, um, David Gushy and what he has done and the work he's provided for the community down there. And not just for the LGBTQ plus community, but like that entire community is better at that church for what he's done. And I feel like um, that was, it's, you know, not that I'm a, you know, I, I don't wanna undersell. I was, I didn't, you know, I don't, I try not to do gross general stereotypes um, stereotypes of anybody, um, generalizations. But um, that story uh, was really meaningful to me, and it made me uh, it, it made me feel um, really good to be in that church with those people, and that was a really wonderful feeling when we were we were filming it and learning about them and meeting people and talking with them and going into parishioners homes and interviewing them and it was really uh really meaningful so i would say that i want to just jump on just very briefly to that part of what i think made it meaningful for you gahani and i know for me is that we learned how radical that church is you know, in, in the world of um, Southern Baptist congregations um, and in the leadership of you know, many Southern Baptist conventions, um, what that church is doing is radical. Um, and so no, going in knowing 
that um, and knowing that every single person we were talking to is aware of their radicalism. Um, and they, um, it's a journey. It's not easy for many of them. I hope the film conveys that. That's been a journey for them. Um, but I think that it, you, you just, you, you get sort of chills being in that environment, knowing um, the convictions that those people have. Carla asks, are there any plans that you have to maybe, she's already asking for a sequel gang, so be prepared. <laughs> are there any plans to do a similar kind of exploration outside the borders of the United States? So would you look at, at the antidote, the expat antidote or whatever you might call it? Mm -hmm. International antidote. International yeah. antidote. Not, well, I mean, listen, we're living in a moment that globally feels pretty unsettled and kind of cruel. That's not just here in the United States, unfortunately. I mean, the, the honest answer to the question is that no, we've not, we've not set anything like that in motion. The other on, honest answer is that's a great idea. And, <laughs> and you know, I think that if there is, if this kind of conversation um, should be happening globally, um, I, I would love to be a part of that conversation, so. Uh, Me too. The, the title of the film is The Antidote. Now you could have called this thing any number of different things. You could have called it Rover for, or anything, right? Why the antidote? Presumably that's, that is, that is a specific term, is a specific meaning. Can you walk us through when you sat down and said, what are we going to call this thing? How did you come up with the antidote? And, and presumably what's the poison or what's the problem? <laughs> John. <laughs> well, I think this is the thing we had the hardest time working together on was the title. We laugh because we've been asked that question before. And I think that our, our laughter will remain genuine eternally when we talk about this because we could not come up with a title for this film for the longest time. Um, and so we would, uh, I usually would be the one to say, we've got to sit down, we've got to come up with a title. And I would come up with a list of titles um, and I would go into every one of those conversations feeling like, you know, there's some good ideas here. And Kahani would, you know, sort of roll her eyes and I would feel sort of humiliated. <laughs> and then Kahani mm -hmm. would occasionally come up with some ideas and you could take a look from here. <laughs> well, I might have rolled my eyes, but with my ideas, John just got weirdly silent, which is very unusual for him. So we were just not agreeing on, on the title. And, you know, we went, I mean, we went through, you know, every pun, every cheesy thing, no offense, every, every, every iteration of this, you know, what it could be. And it was really hard. And then one day we were, you know, back in sort of our, title brainstorming bat cave situation. And um, one of us said, well, let's just think, what is our film? What's our film? Like, and then one of, we can't remember who said what, but one of us said, well, it's the antidote to blah, blah, blah. And then the other one said the antidote. And then we just looked at each other. I annoyed John by having to sleep on it. Um, and, but came back the next day feeling like we had our title and, uh, and, um, the only time we questioned it was, uh, you know, back in March, April, when COVID was really, really hitting. Um, and then the murder of George Floyd happened. It just, can, you know, we were like, with COVID, is this the right title at this time? And then with George Floyd's murder, we, we even questioned for, a, you know, briefly, is this filming out at the right time like is it just it's just the world need to focus on other things right now but um kind of what you said sean earlier about community is we realized what was getting through people through all of this seemed to be this uh, communities that were helping each other so we realized that there was uh maybe even more of a need for the film now so that was a digression off the title but um anyway uh we decided it was the right title and we stuck with it. And I'm really, really glad we did. Having had the experience together, and it sounds like as with any creative process, there's always a little bit of tension or friction around the name or whatever it might be. Uh, what have you learned? Because you, I mean, it seems to me a kind of a nice gift for folks to say, here's, here's some funding, go out and make this movie about kindness as Charlottesville is happening, as many of us are sitting in this sort of milieu of just 
Uh, well, I mean, the 21st century now apparently means that we're just plugged in and receiving more information all the time. It feels like an assault sometimes, but you had the luxury of sort of sitting back and observing the world from a slightly different perch or with a different purpose. What was that like for you? Do you feel more optimistic now in light of COVID, in light of the, the murder of George Floyd and the racial reckoning and, and maybe some of the ugliness we're even seeing in the aftermath of the election? Well, I, I, I'm gonna, um, what I've, what I've learned um, over the past few weeks now that the film has been out um, actually makes me quite sad um, in that um, we're hearing from so many people that uh, they watch the film and, and the, the level, the emotion response they have that the film makes them cry. The film starts and they find themselves crying you know, from the beginning. And, and this, this just hasn't been, you know, you know, a few people. It's been a lot of people. That oh, have I was introduced to the movie. Eric Brown called me up, said, you gotta watch this and I promise you, you're gonna cry in five minutes. And <laughs> damn it if he wasn't right. So, <laughs> so I, I'm gonna go back to something that Rain Henderson um, said to us when she came to see the film at a very, very early stage and had an, a very, a, an emotional response to the film. And she, she talked about um, the collective trauma that she believes that, that is being experienced by our society. Um, and I, I had never thought of, of framing um, the state of our country in that way, but it, it has stayed with me. And I cannot help but think because when we, this film was essentially in this shape um, a year ago. It got better and better and better, hopefully, but it was, it, the stories were, 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 had gelled and the film as an overall experience we were starting to share it with people to get feedback. And so it's essentially the same thing, but there were a few points where we had anticipated that people would have an emotional response. But the now people are talking about a level of response that is not, and then we, we shared it over the months to come, but there's something different. What, and I don't know what that is, and I don't know why, but I think it has to be paid attention to. Um, because it tells me that there's something, um, there's something wrong, um, that people would react this powerfully to stories like this, um, that they did not react to in the same way a year ago, and probably would not have reacted the same way, let's say, four years ago. But there's something about now, and I, so I don't know what that is, but, um, it's, it's concerning to me that, that there's, a, a, and people talk about a release, they talk about carrying and, and the reaction to the election and, and so much of what we just see people just saying, you know, I felt 20 pounds, I feel 20 pounds lighter, you know, this burden is lifted from me. Um, and so what, what do we do with that? And how do we, how do we heal? And if the film is part of healing, that, that's, that would be amazing, but there's something deeper at work. Rain, maybe this is a good place to bring you in. Uh, you are charged with helping to get this film out in front of as many people as possible. So maybe I'll throw you a softball first. How can we help the folks who are with us? And then to your observation, this we're, year this year feels a little different and a little it's being an understatement. Um, how do you tell a story? How do you present a story of kindness and community in this moment? when so many people are so wound up and feeling very fervent and very passionate, very emotional? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So the first one is there's, um, you know, the, the best thing that everybody can do is to go to our website and see different ways that they can watch the film. So there's multiple opportunities. So there's a whole team of really smart people who are in charge of the traditional film distribution, the theatrical release. And so we, you know, have virtual theatrical cinema so folks can uh, log on to our website and see where they can purchase the ticket nearby. Um, but also you guys have been very generous to provide this opportunity for your network to see the film. So people should still have time today to watch and I encourage them to do so if they haven't seen it yet. Um, no shame, we know everybody's busy, but if you have a chance to watch after this. So yeah, the, you know, I have spent a lot of my career working with foundations and nonprofits and, and working on systemic change and looking at things like the social determinants of health. And I often think about, you know, when I was overseeing a nonprofit, if I had tried to tell the story of our work, if I tried to create a film, I would have wanted something that looked very much like the antidote that really shows like 
what is systemic transformation? Like, what is it that ails us? What are these fundamental unkindnesses? And how, you know, how do we show that they're not caused by a single thing and that they're not solved by a single thing, right? But that they're solved by inclusive, supportive community. So this film is such a gift that everybody that we talk to about it, even if they're skeptical, you know, plenty of organizations and foundations are skeptical when you say it's a film about kindness. Um, but we do often lean into saying, this is a film that really is meant to show people who we are. The goal is that when people watch the film, they say, yes, this is us. Th this is everywhere. This is my name. This is how I feel when I'm in my community. But yet somehow when I tune into the news, I feel differently. I, I, I am reminded of who we are. That is the point of this film. And so when sharing this film, giving people the opportunity, uh, and that's, that's the thing about trauma is you can't actually heal from trauma when you are in the midst of it. Um, but if you have an opportunity for your aperture to be open and to be reminded that there's a possibility, that's when healing begins. So this Feel, this film has the possibility of helping us heal and demonstrating so much of the work that organizations that are members of your network are doing every day. So I, I think about like community foundations. I think about the Mott Foundation, the Robert Johnson Foundation, all the organizations that are looking at these fundamental unkindnesses and figuring out how to get people to pay attention to those, but not to focus on those, but to think about solutions. That's what this film does. This film is all about community assets, right? And like using the assets of a community to lift others up. So um, I feel like my job has been very easy because I've gone to organizations like yours and other foundations and said, I have this beautiful gift. It's a film that really demonstrates your work on this beautiful canvas, this choral essay of people from all over the country who look like your neighbors, who are your neighbors. Um, and, you know, watch the film, share the film and tell us how would you use these six questions? Would you use these six questions to drive the way you think about your strategies within your organizations to drive conversation that's about civics and democracy uh, in this country. And so we've given our partners a lot of latitude to just to do exactly that. So we have partners who are very engaged in driving people to volunteer in their communities to replicate some of the acts and the jobs and the you know support that they're seeing throughout the film. And then we have other partners who are really taking a, a, a strong sort of philosophical look at those six questions and saying like, how do we answer these as an organization? How do we answer these as a community? Um, how do we lead? What does that look like? Um, and so we, we're asking people to sort of tell us how you want to use the film and reach out and let us know how we can make that possible. So, so why Watch the film and connect and think about how you can use these stories to really demonstrate the impact that you're having as an organization every day. Question from our colleague Janet. I want to make sure we get to that. Janet asks, building on the title decision, antidote is defined as a medicine to counteract a particular poison. Do you think the film can achieve that or how are you using the film to mitigate unkind acts? And then another piece of this is, or can you talk about how you plan to leverage the message of this film to foster civic engagement in a more productive way that leads to more community building? Yeah. Anybody wants to take a swing at that? John? Kahn. John, you're muted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fantastic question. And I, I, I'm going to um, make sure that uh, this, this is an opportunity to talk about the partners that we do have. Um, and the people who made this possible. So obviously, I mentioned Dignity Health early on. Um, and they um, supported this film in a, in a, you know, at a remarkable level. But we have the Einhorn Collaborative, the Andrew Miku Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, um, and we have uh, an anonymous you know, supporter. Um, we also um, have the Lumina Foundation that's helping with this uh, impact work that Rain is working on. Um, and we have the Bertha Foundation that helped as, as well with that. So those foundations have come together to really, because they understand that um, documentary, they believe in the power of documentary to change hearts and minds. Um, and, but then it has to go out, it has to be a living work that people can engage with. And it, it, it is an, it's just proven to be a fantastic conversation starter because often with difficult issues, it's hard to personalize it or it's hard to talk and personally either your, your own experience or point to something in your community where that it might not be working, things that might not be functioning as, as well as they should. But then you have this other, this objective sort of story that you can all start talking about and then maybe ease into conversations about yourself and your own community. So that's some of the power of a film to, to work in that way. But 
we are filmmakers who go on to do other things. We are we have careers that demand that we you know take on other issues. Luckily, we are both filmmakers who get to um, apply our craft to try to make the world a better place. Um, and we've taken on a lot of issues in our work and we will continue to do that. So this is a film that we want people, as, as, as Rain says so beautifully, it's a gift because this film, you know, it's a fully funded work of, you know, of, of, of um, art, hopefully that's out there that we want people to, you know, take and promote and, and tell everyone else about and use. It's going to be living on Amazon and iTunes and Google Play and, uh, it, it, it'll be so easily accessible to people. Um, it's, we have an educational distributor. We want this in schools. There's school, we've been approached by school districts who want to make it mandatory viewing for all of their students. That is the greatest compliment in the world to us as creators that, that this could be seen in that way. So, um, and I don't know how else to answer it except that we have an audience here that um, is connected to very, you know, powerful drivers in our society and we just say you know please use it one of the uh one of the things i think is sort of implicit in in kindness is this idea and you actually speak to it with the organization that helped to kick this all off with is the idea of dignity which is something that we all carry we all bring there's been a lot of kind of academic work on the power of dignity and even this idea we talked about trauma about dignity violations did you guys spend much time thinking about kindness as sort of an action to verify or support people's dignity? Was that something you spent some time thinking about that? Dignity is more of a concept and less, or as an academic concept and how kindness addresses that? I think that, um, you know, dignity, uh, even though it's not one of the words that we pulled out to use in our sort of descriptor line, which, you know, stories of kindness, decency, and the power of community, I think that it was um, a, a, a theme that was in every single story. And um, some people talked about it directly and some people just showed us by the way they treat other people. And so I think that, um, I think that dignity, you know, besides the fact that uh, one of the you know, companies that supported us very generously has that name. I think there's a reason that uh, a company that, that whose slogan is hello human kindness is also called Dignity Health. Like I do think they are intrinsically, uh, you know, related and they were related in our film. And Diamon um, Harges, who has the bike shop in Indianapolis, he speaks about dignity and uh, Jordan Herrera, who really goes out of her way in Amarillo, Texas to deliver a check to a auto repair shop, talks about treating people with dignity. It doesn't matter what you do, you have to treat them with dignity. So there's people who speak about it directly, but if you think about um, every story, the Boston homeless story, like if it's not mentioned, it's demonstrated. And I just think it, it is your right to point it out as like a really powerful aspect of the stories we were telling and, and beyond the stories we were telling, it's about, you know, how we all should be treating each other, which I think is at the heart of the film. There's um, a, for folks who are interested, uh, there's a woman named Donna Hicks, uh, who teaches at Harvard, who's done a, a written quite a bit about <laughs> dignity, and she's done a lot of work. Interesting, her, her background is actually in international conflict resolution. And so her whole thesis is that, I wonder if it has application to our society right now, but she looked at, she worked with Desmond Tutu, and in South Africa, and then in some of his work helping to resolve the troubles up in Northern Ireland, was this idea that there were dignity violations that were ultimately, ultimately at play. That even people who were directly involved in a conflict frequently felt their dignity assaulted by events that were happening around them or to people that they knew, even if perhaps from a little bit of a remove. Uh, Sandy, our friend, has a question. So Sandy, I'm gonna plug you in and say you can talk because you raised your hand. Uh, Sandy, you're on with us. If you'll unmute, Go ahead when you when you got a sec. You can turn on your camera too if you'd like, but if you don't have your hair did, no worries. You can just use the audio. Oh, Sandy, you there? There she is. Okay, just unmute if you would. See if I can do it for you. Don't Looks like she's getting that. added as a panelist. Aha, okay, thank you, Tristan. Let's see if we can do that. 
we might have lost her along the way. Uh, Tristan is adding her as a panelist. All right, so just let's stand by for her. What's the, so we only have a couple of minutes left. What's the question John or Kahani Rain jump into? The question you haven't been at, you've been talking to lots of folks presumably over the last couple of weeks as the film's coming out. What's the question you wish someone would ask you and they haven't yet? It's a question that hasn't made it out that's been sitting on the cutting room floor or the one you just are like, man, would someone please fire that one my way? Hmm, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that it's the question not asked, but you know, in the beginning, there were a lot of conversations and concerns around showing some of these fundamental unkindnesses. Were these, you know, were we wading into deep political territory? Um, and so, I personally keep waiting for people to sort of wave that flag after they've seen the film, and it hasn't happened yet. So, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a question, um, but it's it's interesting. We spend a lot of time talking about that and thinking about that, and how will these issues be perceived? But yet, all of the feedback we got from the audiences and the foundations and the organizations who watched it, they don't raise that. So. Well, that is a question. Was this a political film on some level, Kahani and John? Were you, did you bring a political lens to this or, or a bias maybe, do you think? It's a great question. Great question. I, I would say that we worked very hard to not have a bias. I don't think it's impossible to remove all your biases, but we worked hard at that. Um, and is it a political film? Um, I. I hope that some people do see it as a political film. I don't think it is as, as, as you go through it, I don't think it in and of itself is a political film, but I hope some people through their, their lens see it as political. If that is a sort of like talking out of both sides of my mouth, it's probably true, but um, I, I do, um, I would be dishonest if I didn't say that I hope that some people would see some political dimensions in the film. I think, um, you know, one thing that's interesting uh, that we've talked about a lot of times is would we have made this film prior to 2016? And if we're going to be really, really honest, I don't think it would have necessarily occurred to us to do this film. But when you look at the issues that are, that each story explores, Every single one of them, you know, has, has been an issue that certainly predates 2016 and has been around for, you know, years, decades, and in some cases, centuries as are problems that we are have systemically here. It doesn't matter. Um, it's not related to 20. So it's, it's interesting. I think that, you know, the motivation was uh, triggered by the, the very time we were living in, as I mentioned, this pervasive sense of civility crumbling. But I think in the end, the problems pre-exist, pre-existed 2016. Um, and certainly we never talked politics with our subjects. We don't, we don't know, you know, we don't know who they voted for. That was not the point of making this film. That was the point of seeing what connected us all, not what divides, so. What, what uh, as we head into next year, and there's a whole bunch in front of us in terms of potentially a new kind of policy approach and, and a different political lens potentially, also feels, and, a, and one would hope maybe a vaccine and, and the beginnings of the end of, of this pandemic, not only here, but around the world. What are some of your hopes for next year based on what you've seen I mean, you were making this film at a time that was pre-COVID when you could go out into the world and see people interacting with one another. And that's an experience most of us haven't had for many months. We've been fortunate to have that chance to retreat. Uh, many of these folks probably didn't because of the work that they do. They've been out in the communities. What, uh, what's your hope for next year based, based on the experiences you've seen? Are, are you optimistic that you, you just showed us a slice of what's out there in the world or is there more of this to come or less in terms of people okay. engaging their community and being kind to one? I mean, I think we all hope there's there's more. And in the same way that, you know, we're gathered here as a community today speaking. And so, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So hopefully there's this vaccine and this, you know, need for social distancing is behind us and we can all interact. Again, you know, our film really paid attention 
like by design to human touch. Mm -hmm. And that is severely lacking right now in everyone's lives, you know, beyond who you're in a pod with. And um, so I just hope that that comes back. I, I had um, the chance to screen the film um, on like projected on a screen on a, on a friend's front porch. And one of the people attending, I mean, she was sobbing the whole way through, but one of the things at the end when she was listing all the things was that seeing everyone to humans together interacting in a way that they can't right now, just like tore her apart. And um, so obviously, you know, uh, without sounding like the beauty pageant person, like you want world peace and we want a vaccine and you want all that stuff, but really I can't wait for, um, um, you know, communities of people to get to interact in person together and for touch and hugs to come back. I just think it's important and, um, but I also think like this, you know, we envisioned all of these kinds of conversations as something in person in a room together. And that can't be, but we found another way to do it. So I feel like no matter how long it takes, like there's opportunities for community. Um, John, what about you? Lessons, lessons you've learned over the course of the film and, and what the path ahead might look like. Um, one of the great lessons is from Diamond Harjus where he says stories are a philanthropic effort, a philanthropic act. Act. Yeah, philanthropic act. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I, I think that we are all by you know, our nature storytellers. I think it's just in our DNA. Um, but then listening becomes, I think, the limiting factor. So um, Biaman's official title uh, is the roving listener. Um, and so I just think that that's um, to Rain's point about healing, trying to sort of tie these things together. I don't think there's going to be healing. There's going to be, there's a, there needs to be a lot of healing from this pandemic, literally and spiritually. Um, and there needs to be a lot of healing from this economic crisis that we're in. Um, and there needs to be a lot of healing from this you know, hate crisis that we're in. So there's just all these, but it's not gonna happen unless uh, people feel that they have a voice and that they're gonna be heard. So um, that's not what our film was overtly about, but I think that we depicted, a, you know, worlds in which that's what's happening between people. Rain, what about you? Oh, I, I want this to be a turning point in how we feel about each other. I, I, I you know, the, the antidote, I was lucky because I got to think about it all through the pandemic and days when I got up and I felt lonely and disconnected. I was reminded of Issa in Alaska and Diem in, in Indianapolis and, you know, Jim in Boston. And I think I, I want this to be a turning point in how we think about each other, how we think about ourselves. And I want more people to feel that the antidote is representative. And my bet is, John said I'm allowed to say this now, I think this is the Schitt's Creek of documentaries. A year from now, I want everyone to find out that this was the turning point and putting out, you know, sort of issues of connection as if it's like not a big deal. You know, you watch Schitt's Creek, and you see the stories of inclusion and you don't think anything about it. I want that to be the case a year from now with the antidote to people say that was, that was the moment. This was the story of us. Mm. We're just seeing a lot of thank yous. I know we're up at the top sure. of the hour. We want to be respectful of your time. I'll just say yeah. thank you. Uh, speaking personally for my, my family, this was an incredible gift to get to see this film. And I think one of the things that the act of making the film was a beautiful thing because one of the things I, I just will observe from our own experience as a family is when you see someone, it's hard to look away. It's hard to ignore people when you really look to see them. And what you did with the camera was bring a camera in and allow us to see so many people across our beautiful country being kind and doing the very thing the camera was doing, seeing other human beings and being generous and treating them with dignity and respect and, that's, and, and being kind in an active, intentional way, as you all said at the outset. It's a beautiful thing. And for us, sitting kind of lonely, mostly quarantined, thank you. It was a hugely, hugely helpful thing uh, and something that we will not uh, look lightly on as a family. And I think that's probably reflective of everybody uh, who's had a chance to see the film. And we will certainly do our best to make sure as many folks as we know can see it. So thanks you, thank you to, to all of you for the work that you Thank you.
an incredibly kind and decent good thing of all of all <laughs> you be doing. So we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thanks to everyone who attended to for, for um, watching the film or for watching the film after this and, and for your questions and, and for what you're doing. We really, it mean, it's very meaningful. And a big shout out to, even though he's gone, Eric Brown. Yes, Eric, Eric Brown. Eric Zemech. All right, everybody. Thank yes. you so much, Tristan and Rebecca, who offered us closed captioning throughout the hour. So uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Be well. Bye.